The 2020 NFL schedule has been released. That means it's time for me to give you my record predictions for the 2020 NFL season. Before I do, Gronk spike the like button and subscribe to the bottom line view for more NFL predictions just like this. And don't forget to comment below your opinion on your team's record. Let's kick it off with the AFC East. The team that many are crowning as the next in line for the division title is the Buffalo Bills. They're very well coached under Sean McDermott, who frustrates opponents on a weekly basis with his game-specific defensive plans. They already have one of the best secondaries in the league, led by Tredavious White, added that depth to the defensive line through free agency with Quinton Jefferson, Mario Addison, Vernon Butler, and in the draft selecting the versatile and powerful A.J. Epinesa. Josh Allen, your time is now. I believe he's going to take an even bigger step in year three now that he has a legitimate number one target in Stephon Diggs. If their offensive line can also take a step forward with him, the Bills can be scary good. I have them as the number three seed in the AFC at 10 and six. The Dolphins are the classic case of premature hype. One season too early for my taste. Yes, they have significantly improved their roster and made a lot of very nice moves this offseason, starting with building the ideal Brian Flores defense, signing Byron Jones, forming one of the best cornerback duos in football, maybe even trios in football. Kyle Van Noy, Emmanuel Ogba, Shaq Lawson are all kind of hybrid edge players who fit perfectly within Brian Flores' scheme. I just don't know if they're going to be able to consistently score points. I don't like the quarterback situation for this year. Fitzpatrick, as we know, is very streaky. Tua's coming off an injury, and this offseason isn't exactly ideal for a rookie. The offensive line went from the worst in the league to, I guess, one of the worst in the league? I don't think Eric Flowers, Ted Karras, and a couple rookies are enough to drastically improve that unit in year one. But because I love Brian Flores and how he has his team playing on a weekly basis, I will give them a 7-9 and nine record. Versus this schedule, that's a pretty significant improvement. The thought that the Patriots will try to tank is absurd. Why? Because if you think about it, the formula to win games for New England doesn't really change much from the 2019 season, even with Brady leaving. Win by out-scheming opponents, play tough defense by relying on your outstanding secondary, make plays on special teams, and as the Patriots always do, win the bad weather games. Can Nikhil Harry become the number one go-to receiver? And will David Andrews reignite a dominant offensive line? If those two things happen, the Patriots will have a winning record and make the playoffs. As of now, I have them at eight and eight, just outside the wild card. I realize the Jets went seven and nine last season with Darnold battling through mono and without their stud linebackers. I get all that, but the entire AFC East had a laughably easy schedule last year. I haven't seen anything from Sam Darnold that has me saying, wow, I have to be buying his stock. They have key flaws on both sides of the ball. No true number one receiver. The offensive line is an unknown and their weaknesses remain at corner and pass rush. A team that's weaknesses or question marks lie in the passing game is a team that just won't make it very far in the modern NFL. Don't get me wrong. I love aspects of the Jets roster. I think their front seven is excellent at defending the run. Mosley and Williamson at linebacker will definitely help this defense. And they have one of the best pair of safeties in football. Offensively, their offensive line should be a little bit better. The question is how much better? Drafting Becton at left tackle, adding McGovern at center, Van Roten at guard, that's three new starters protecting Darnold. If I were higher on Sam Darnold, I'd probably be buying in on the New York Jets. I have the Jets going seven and nine for the second straight season. I love what Baltimore did for their defense this offseason. I could see the Ravens possibly having the top defense in all of football this year. They have an incredible, not talked enough about defensive mind in Wink Martindale, a top three secondary in the sport led by Marlon Humphrey. And man, did they really improve both their run defense and their pass rush. Acquiring Calais Campbell, Derek Wolf, to go along with Brandon Williams on the interior defensive line, Matt Judon is still on the edge. That gives the Ravens more than just 
just one guy that can get after the quarterback and a run defense that can put you in some pretty bad passing situations. Plus, they drafted Patrick Queen to fix their linebacking group offensively. I would have liked to have seen them do a little bit more. I'm not going to lie, especially after losing future Hall of Famer Marshall Yonda at guard. The weapons in the passing game, they don't really wow me much, but Marquise Brown should get better. Mark Andrews is awesome, and their run game should still be elite. Let's hope Lamar doesn't get the Madden curse, because this team is ready now for a championship. The Ravens finish as the number one seed in the AFC once again at 12 and four. From the number one seed to the number one pick, don't sleep on the Bengals. I think there's a possibility Joe Burrow and the Bengals shock the NFL and win more games than they really should. Burrow certainly has the weapons. AJ Green should be back and healthy, at least I hope. Tyler Boyd is an elite receiver in the slot. T. Higgins, the burner John Ross, top tier running back Joe Mixon. This offense has explosive capability. The unit that probably does hold them back though is their offensive line. I just don't see how this unit is any better than bottom five in the league. Cincinnati does have arguably the most underrated defensive line in football after adding DJ Reader, who can really help that run defense, which was horrendous a year ago. And the secondary, you add Trey Waynes, Mackenzie Alexander of the Vikings at corner, and Vaughn Bell at the safety position. Zach Taylor has a lot to prove to me though. If I was a little bit more certain about Zach Taylor as a coach, I'd be willing to be more bold about Cincy. I have the Bengals at five and 11. Maybe I'm a sucker, but I'm buying the Browns this season. The areas that held them back in 2019, coaching, offensive line, defensive depth, have all been solved this offseason. I mean, if Baker doesn't make something happen with this amount of talent around him, he'll never be able to do it. Odell and Landry at wide receiver, Hooper and Najoku at tight end, Chubb and Hunt at running back, and an offensive line that can straight up dominate this season, fixing their tackle issue by signing Jack Conklin, drafting Jedrick Wills in the first round. This defense has studs like Miles Garrett, Denzel Ward, and added plenty of depth on the defensive line, Billings, Elliott, and Claiborne. I don't love Kevin Stefanski, but I do think he's an upgrade over Freddie Kitchens. The Browns are a team who will dominate you physically up front on both sides of the football. If Odell and their secondary can stay healthy and Baker can simply not turn the ball over, this team will be very difficult to beat. The Browns finish 9-7 and seven and make the playoffs. I don't know if the Steelers have all of a sudden become boring or something, but not enough people are talking about how good they possibly can be in 2020. If Ben can come back and be Big Ben Roethlisberger, the Steelers can compete for the AFC crown. They almost made the playoffs with Duck Hodges in 2019, and they only got better this offseason. Even if Ben isn't great, this team has made an effort to go power football and beat you in multiple ways. They've made the effort to transform back into the Steeler teams of the past. Tough, big, defense first football teams who can grind out victories. Offensively expect to see a lot more two tight end sets, a lot more heavy sets. Eric Ebron, Vance McDonald, they brought in Derek Watt at fullback and the freak Chase Claypool. It's not like they don't have receivers, they have Juju. Look out for Deontay Johnson in his second season. Pittsburgh returns to the playoffs with a 9-7 and record. The Colts are a lot like Pittsburgh to me, a veteran quarterback who won't have to be relied on to be a successful team. Frank Reich is an excellent offensive coach. He'll make it easy on Phillip Rivers. The offensive line in Indy is arguably the best in football, and there is a reason the team drafted Jonathan Taylor to go along with Marlon Mack. They want to run the ball. This is a team that lost six one-score games last year. A lot of that was because of subpar quarterback play, a lack of weapons over the last half of the season. Rivers is an upgrade over Brissett. T.Y. Hilton missed six games. He will be back. They drafted Michael Pittman to be a complimentary receiver. Naeem Hines is the type of receiving back that thrives playing with Phillip Rivers. Matt Eberflus's defense added Julian Blackman, Xavier Rhodes in the secondary, along with the monster DeForest Buckner. And look out for Kamiko Ture. In such a competitive division, the difference between the Texans playing a team like the Chiefs and the Colts playing the Raiders is huge. Quality coaching, solid defense, improved quarterback play will have the Colts winning the AFC South 
at nine and seven. The Texans are one of those teams to me that really have no reason to compete in 2020. But there's one guy who is making me pause. And that man is Deshaun Watson. He is easily a top five quarterback in the sport right now. And when you have an elite quarterback like Deshaun Watson, you can win some games that you really have no business winning. Even without DeAndre Hopkins, Houston can still score a lot of points. Will Fuller, Brandon Cooks, Kenny Stills, Randall Cobb, David Johnson, Duke Johnson. That's plenty of weapons for Watson to work with, but can you really win every game if every game is a shootout? I can't see their defense being any good next season. All they did was lose their second best defensive player, and they did nothing to fix their secondary or their pass rush. And you have to think at some point, the GM Bill O'Brien is going to cost the coach Bill O'Brien. I know the Texans will be exciting, but I don't think exciting necessarily means successful. I have the Texans dropping to seven and nine. The Jaguars are clearly the worst team in the AFC South. Three crucial areas of their football team, they're just not very good. The quarterback, the offensive line, and the secondary, that's three of the four most important parts that impact wins and losses in the NFL. But hey, they're rebuilding, and it's not like they have no talent. Henderson, Chason, Allen, Chark. The problem is, though, that their most talented guys are all very young, all basically within their first three seasons of even being in the NFL. They have pieces for the future, but this is a prediction for the 2020 season. Jacksonville goes 2-14, and 14, but at least they'll be in good position to pick the quarterback of the future. Can the Titans replicate, or should I say continue last season's success? Remember, they just squeaked into the playoffs at 9-7. and seven. It's not like they went 12-4 and four or 14-2. and two. My biggest pause for the Titans making it back to the playoffs is losing defensive coordinator Dean Pease, who is one of the best defensive minds in the NFL for many seasons. They also lost Jarrell Casey up front, and they have to deal with replacing Jack Conklin at right tackle. My prediction is that the Titans' defense takes a step backward. I have the Titans finishing 8-8. Eight and eight. If there is one team that can challenge the almighty Chiefs in the AFC West, it is the Broncos. Locke went 4-1 late last season, only losing to those same Chiefs in that stretch. Denver had one of the best off-seasons of any team in the NFL. Trading for Jarrell Casey, signing Melvin Gordon to pair with Phillip Lindsay, drafting wide receivers Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler. Don't forget that both Bradley Chubb and Jawan James will return from injury. Denver has one major question. How good is Drew Locke really? If he is the guy, surrounded by this talent, the Broncos will give the Chiefs everything they can handle and more. I have the Broncos making the playoffs as a wildcard team at 9-7. and seven. The Chiefs have officially entered the rare territory of, it's not if you can make the playoffs, it's what you can do for me when you get there. They are now the champs. They are the team to beat. They will certainly see their fair share of quality opponents at Baltimore, at New Orleans, at Tampa Bay, at Buffalo, not to mention their division is significantly improved. They will be in the conversation and have a great shot at a repeat, thanks to Patrick Mahomes and an extremely talented offense. Adding Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is a mismatch weapon out of the backfield that makes this dynamite, oh, even more dynamite and awesome to watch. I have the Kansas City Chiefs finishing 11-5 due to a concerning cornerback group with not a lot of depth and a challenging schedule. John Gruden now has his three offensive centerpieces, Waller, Ruggs, and Jacobs. Along with an elite offensive line, Derek Carr may have his best supporting cast he's had in a while. Vegas revamped the linebacker position with Littleton and Kwiatkowski in free agency, added Demarius Randall and Heath at safety to complement Abram and Joyner. Carl Nassib is a perfect complement to the young players at the edge position. Is their defense ready? That's really what I want to know. Were those moves enough? If we see significant improvement from their pass rush, from their cornerback position, this team can definitely make the playoffs, but I'm not 100% sold. 8-8 eight and eight for the Raiders. Do the Chargers have the quarterback to take them anywhere in 2020? I like Herbert as a long-term solution, but I don't think he's ready day one. And Tyrod Taylor is, well, Tyrod Taylor. So for me, the answer is no. It sucks because the rest of the roster is really as good as any in the league. 
They have an elite pass rushing duo with Joey Boza and Melvin Ingram. Linville Joseph on the interior will only bolster that defensive line. An elite secondary headlined by a ridiculous cornerback trio in Harris, Hayward, and King. Brian Balaga, Trey Turner, they brought in to help that offensive line. The Chargers will be a pain for a lot of teams and be competitive in just about every game, but their quarterback play, just average coaching, will hold them back from making the playoffs. Chargers go seven and nine. Flip over to the NFC. In the NFC East, Cowboys haters, they may say that they lost Byron Jones, Travis Frederick, and Robert Quinn. Therefore, they're not going to make the playoffs. I get it. Those are good players, but honestly, their roster last year was absolutely loaded. They had the number one offense and number nine defense statistically and still didn't make the playoffs last year. The number one thing that will help this team is a new voice in the locker room, a new coaching staff. Mike McCarthy is a massive upgrade over Jason Garrett. Mike Nolan defensively will take this stale conservative defensive scheme update it, make it better, and Kellen Moore will be in his second season calling the offense. They're better at safety with HaHa Clinton Dix, deeper on the interior of the defensive line with McCoy, Poe, and drafting Gallimore. If they can get Gregory or Alden Smith motivated on the edge and playing at full speed, this D-line can be dominant. They made the playoffs without Travis Frederick just two seasons ago and are much more dynamic offensively. They're borderline unstoppable now with C.D. Lamb. The Cowboys will be an explosive, fun team in 2020 that I see in the conversation of the NFC elite. Dallas wins the NFC East at 11 and 5. I have a lot of respect for how the Philadelphia Eagles are run from the ownership on down. Their head coach, quarterback combo, Carson Wentz, Doug Peterson, one of the best in the game. Not only are the Eagles elite at coach and quarterback, but they're also dominant in the trenches as well. There are not many teams in the NFL with a better offensive line, defensive line combination. Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham will welcome the monster Javon Hargrave with open arms. And they'll have Malik Jackson back in the fold. I'd not want to run up the middle versus this team. Kelsey, Brandon Brooks, Lane Johnson, that is stud 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 I love how they brought in speed at wide receiver because yeah sure they're not the most talented players but they went from arguably the slowest offense in the league last year to one of the fastest by bringing in Rieger, Goodwin, and Deshaun Jackson, who is back from injury. That's just going to change how defenses defend you and open up space for Ertz, Sanders, and Goddard. The biggest reason I'm sold on the Eagles, though, is their improved secondary. Slay, Nicole Roby Coleman, this will allow Schwartz to be more creative defensively, mixing in blitzes, more man-to-man -man coverage. It's going to take them to the next level. The Eagles make the playoffs at 10-6. and six. Is Joe Judge the man for the job in New York? One thing I know for sure is he will bring attention to detail, work ethic, and character back to the head coach spot of New York. Of course, there's Saquon, who when healthy is, in my opinion, the best back in the league. Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, the Giants on paper... They have their best offensive line they've had in years, adding Andrew Thomas at right tackle in the draft. The ultimate question, though, is Daniel Jones. The Daniel Jones jump. How big of a jump will we see? Can he cut down the fumbles but continue to be aggressive? I still feel there are a lot of holes on this defense. Uncertain about the new look secondary. Where will the pressure come from? The G-Men will be a roller coaster team capable of being in any game but they're still a few pieces away from challenging for the NFC East. The Skins are probably looking at another high draft pick in 2021. Even though this team has the makings of a great front seven, I mean a scary front seven, they just don't have much else, especially offensively. I don't know how this team figures they're going to score any points. Outside of Scary Terry, they just don't have any weapons, approximately zero. I'm not a huge Haskins guy, especially with this supporting cast. I don't like the rumors that have been floating around about his work ethic and reputation amongst teammates. Ron Rivera, a good coach. I I like Scott Turner as the OC, but I think the expectations should be set very low for this team, at least until next year. The Skins go 3-13. The Chicago Bears. I don't know if I'm as in love with Matt Nagy as everyone else seems to be. I think he's just an average coach. Is Nick Foles 
enough? Because I don't think so. Are they explosive enough offensively? I don't think so. They haven't improved their offensive line. I don't know why, because it sucked last year. Don't have anyone that scares you offensively, even though I'm an Allen Robinson fan. And they couldn't run the ball last year. Regardless, this team remains a defense first team. Their defense under Chuck Pagano, again, will fall somewhere within the top 10. They have a dominant front seven. Adding Robert Quinn certainly won't hurt that. The only flaw I do see on this defense is the secondary. The strong safety for the first time in a long time has a question mark next to it and the corner position, it's just okay. Can Roquan Smith finally be the stud that he was drafted to be? The Bears defense, I believe will keep them in games but I don't think they have the offense to be more than an average team. The Bears go 6-10 and 10 searching for their next quarterback. The Aaron Rodgers, Matt LaFleur friction. The tape is out there on the Packers. Thanks to the 49ers. Seriously, teams across the NFL just run the ball on the Packers because they've yet to actually fix that issue. I don't understand the Packers. They have a strong secondary. They have a strong edge rush, but it won't matter if you can't stop the run and you don't have any weapons to throw the ball to. I mean, Devontae Adams can only do so much. They don't have the luxury this season of facing the NFL's easiest schedule like they did last year. I think the drama between quarterback and coach, that becomes too much to handle for the Packers. Packers when this team starts to lose games because I can see it coming, especially because Aaron Rodgers is not the bad man that he used to be. I have the Packers shockingly going 8-8 eight and eight and missing the playoffs. Matt Patricia, buddy, this is sink or swim time, pal. Unfortunately for him, he was about to swim in 2019 until Matt Stafford went down, but the good news is that Matt Stafford, number nine, is back. This team didn't win a single game without Stafford last year. They were 3-4-1 with him last year, losing one-score games to three different playoff teams, the Chiefs, the Vikings, and the Packers. I mean, the refs or the Packers. My bold prediction is this is the season that Stafford outperforms Aaron Rodgers as the best quarterback in the NFC North. Their offense adds DeAndre Swift, another year of development for TJ Hawkinson at tight end, and they drafted a plethora of linemen. Defensively, their secondary is stronger, and yes, Okuda did replace Slay, but give me the additions of Desmond Trufant and Deron Harmon as well, Jamie Collins, Danny Shelton, Julian Aquora up front. This defense is much more athletic, much more versatile, which suits Matt Patricia. The Lions shock the world. They go worst to first because one of them has to happen every year and they win the NFC North at 9-7. and seven. Zimmer is a great defensive coach. They have studs in Daniil Hunter, Eric Kendricks, and an awesome safety duo in the back end. The one thing that people aren't really mentioning about the Vikings is losing their offensive coordinator. He's now the head coach of the Browns. Young players everywhere for the Vikings, and I don't really love that, especially because of the way that this offseason is looking. Two new starting corners, Justin Jefferson at receiver, who's going to have to fill the shoes of Stephon Diggs. And is Everson Griffin coming back? Because he, if he isn't, that's a huge loss. The Vikings will be a solid team. There's no doubt about it. They have a good coach, a solid quarterback, and a pretty talented roster. But I think they're going to take a step back before they can take two steps forward next season. The Vikings go 9-7 and seven due to their youth and miss the playoffs as the eight seed in the NFC. The NFC South, starting off with the Atlanta Falcons. I'm not buying Gurley in the run game. I'm sorry. I think Todd Gurley is done. Flip it to the defense. Their cornerback situation kind of scares me, especially in a division with Tom Brady and Drew Brees and Bruce Arians and Sean Payton and even the Panthers with their receivers. I'm not a huge fan of the coaching staff. It's definitely the third best in the division. I will say that Raheem Morris did have the defense playing better late last season. I like what Dimitrov did with the front seven, adding Dante Fowler and Marlon Davidson on the defensive line. X factor for me is how does the young offensive line play? Will they be better to protect Matt Ryan? The division got a lot tougher when Tom Brady entered it. Atlanta will be more competitive than their record actually suggests, but they're not good enough to be in the playoff conversation. I have Atlanta again at seven and nine. Not a believer 
Weaver and Bridgewater. I'm sorry, Panther fans. This first season will be used as an adjustment period for their coaching staff because all of them basically are coming from college to the pros. They're very young. They're very raw, especially their defense. They have a lot of potential in that defense, but there's going to be a roller coaster ride. I like Burns. I like Derek Brown, but they're a long ways away from being good. The Panthers may be able to pull off some upsets, but they should be in the combo for one of the top quarterbacks in the 2021 draft. Panthers four and 12. The Saints are loaded up for one last Super Bowl run. Emmanuel Sanders, is he the last piece for this offense? The return of Malcolm Jenkins. They do face a more difficult schedule than Tampa. I will say that. While the Saints play the 49ers and they play in Philadelphia, Tampa plays the Rams and in New York. The Saints chemistry might be the difference though during the regular season between the two teams. I know what this team's gonna give me. Due to this wacky offseason, I think they have the edge over the Bucks, and I think the Saints ultimately take the division and win the NFC South at 11 and 5. The new must see team in the NFL is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Brady, Gronk, the combination of Evans and Godwin. You have Bruce Arians as the coach, the personalities, the fun, the television ratings through the roof. But don't sleep on the talent, especially the defense. We know about how dynamic and multiple this offense could possibly be, but defensively, Shaq Barrett, Sue, David, and a young secondary on the rise. Depending on what happens this offseason with the NFL schedule, I may end up putting Tampa above New Orleans to win the division, but for now, I'm taking the chemistry over the potential. Tampa makes the playoffs, though, for the first season in their first season with Tom Brady at 10-6, and six and probably will be playing their best football as they enter the dance. The NFC West, the 49ers, will they have a Super Bowl hangover? I lean towards no because Kyle Shanahan, that's the reason. He's too great of a coach. He's too great of a schemer. He's too innovative offensively. Can Jimmy G elevate his game? Because that's the difference between the 49ers being a good team again and potentially being a great team team. This is his second full season. Remember, last year was just his first full year in the system and even in the NFL as a starter. What I love about the Niners offseason is they had one eye on the future, but also one eye on the present. They're building the team now without sacrificing the future. The Niners still have arguably the league's most talented roster, a dominant pass rush, a really strong run game. The 49ers win the NFC West again, but it won't be easy facing a first play schedule at 11 and 5. Russ and Coach Pete are good for a playoff spot every year, it seems. I'm hoping the Hawks will put the ball in the hands of Russell Wilson. Let this guy pass. Let this guy free. He has an excellent group of playmakers around him. Dangerous DK Metcalf. Lock it. He could burn you down the field. A sneaky group of tight ends. Of course, the Hawks, they can always run the football with Carson and Penny. They have a set of playmakers around Russell Wilson that I think will allow him to outscore a lot of teams. Their secondary has certainly improved, adding Dunbar. I love that. If they acquire a legit edge rusher, I might increase their win total and potentially even have them above the 49ers as the NFC West champs. But if that doesn't happen, I wonder if they'll have enough up front to beat the elite teams in the NFC. Hawks make the playoffs at 10 and 6. I'm going to be straight up with you about the Cardinals. The Cardinals probably have the highest ceiling and the lowest floor, not only in this division, but also in this entire conference. Their record depends on one person and one person only, and that is Kyler Murray. If Kyler Murray can be special, they're one of the best teams in the NFC. If Kyler Murray doesn't take a huge step in his second season, then they're just okay or maybe a little worse. Defense, much improved. Thanks to four key additions, Jordan Phillips, Devin Kennard, Devondre Campbell, and Isaiah Simmons. Outside of Kyler offensively, they have the weapons. A number one option in D-Hop, Kirk, Fitz are still there. Look out for Isabella's speed, and Kenyon Drake could be a premier back in this league. I'm excited to see what Cliff can do in his second year as a coach, scheming up offense. I have a feeling the Cardinals will be scoring a lot of points this season, but inconsistent offensive line play and defense likely means the Cardinals will just miss out on the playoffs. I have them at 8 and 8. They'll be exciting for sure, though, either way. There's no doubt about that. The LA Rams. I still believe in Sean McVay as a coach and as a leader, but this team has sustained 
far too many losses this offseason. I just don't believe in Jared Goff as anything more than an average quarterback. I actually don't think they'll miss Todd Gurley. Certainly, they do miss Todd Gurley of a couple seasons ago. Brandon Cooks, while not great last year, his speed is no longer present in this offense, and they have to fix their offensive line. The defense has some stars like Donald, Ramsey, but it lacks depth at linebacker and in the secondary. The Rams will not be good enough to make the playoffs and not bad enough for a top pick. I have them falling to 6-10 in 2020. Those are my predictions for every single NFL team and their record. Let me know in the comment section below what you think of my predictions. It's Mitch of The Bottom Line View. Peace out.